Good evening, everyone. My name is Jay Chapa. I'm Deputy City Manager for the City of Fort Worth. And I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for coming, both in person and those folks that are watching this uh, virtually or on our cable channel. Uh, this is a, a really important function that ultimately uh, leads to us selecting our next police chief, which is one of the most important positions in the city. The search process to fill this position has certainly been unique as we have navigated the various issues presented by the COVID pand pandemic. We started the process with our search firm, strategic government resources, engaging stakeholders in virtual focus groups to receive feedback on those traits most desired by residents. Additionally, they conducted surveys of both residents and the employees at the police department. This forum tonight will allow residents to acquaint themselves with the six finalists. The forum is a hybrid event with this ball, ballroom that normally sits over 3,000 people, only providing for about 150 or less than 150 seats. Additionally, various COVID safety precautions are being taken, like the wearing of masks. As I mentioned earlier, this forum is also being streamed on the city's webpage the city's cable channel, and Facebook Live. One of the things I wanted to make sure that everyone knew is if you, as a resident, would like to provide feedback, you can go to the same, web, the same email address where we took questions from citizens, Fort Worth Connection, or FW Connection, excuse me, at fortworthtexas.gov, and submit any feedback that you um, that you have on, on the candidates as we go to now. So now, to kick this off, I'd like to introduce our moderator that will be handling the, the questions this evening. Someone who normally would be ending her day right now and be getting ready for bed. Um, it is our own NBC5 Today anchor, Deborah Ferguson. We typically see Deborah We typically see Deborah every morning way before the sun rises when she and the NBC5 team bring us the news, weather, and traffic between 4.30 and 7 a.m. Deborah is an award-winning journalist, but more than that, she calls Fort Worth home, and she understands the importance of what we're doing tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator, Deborah Ferguson. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hello, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. All right. Thank you, Jay. Okay, you know, there's always a little snafu that goes on when something's coming live, so we got that over with. We got that done. We're all together now, but Jay is right. Normally, with my morning show anchor duties, um, this is about my regular bedtime. I'd be hunkered down in bed counting sheep, but this is a big moment for the city I love, and so I'm here tonight with you. I can always sleep tomorrow through the weekend. We can catch up on that. It is an honor to be here and to be part of this experience. My job tonight is to simply be the connection between what the community wants to know and the six men and women who have the information. Each will tell us why he or she is qualified for this job. They'll respond to your questions and leave us with final thoughts about why we should give them our trust and support. The city opened this interview process to all corners of Fort Worth by asking residents to submit questions they'd like to ask of the city's next police chief. After collecting all of the questions that came in from residents, six major categories came to the forefront. We will focus on these topics tonight, giving each candidate the opportunity to answer each question within a two-minute time frame. 
Before we bring out the finalists, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who invested time and thought to be part of this process. Whether you submitted a question, whether you're in the room tonight, whether you are watching from home, thank you for being part of this important decision. I'd also like to thank the men and women who we will meet tonight, who put on the badge, kiss their families at home goodbye to serve and protect. Ladies and gentlemen, let's meet our candidates for the next police chief of the city of Fort Worth. We will introduce them to you in alphabetical order, giving each one just a moment to stand in the room so you can see them before we bring all of them out. And we begin with Wendy Bainbridge. Wendy Bainbridge comes to us from the uh, Houston Police Department, where she has been the assistant chief since 2017. Chief Bainbridge, good evening and thank you for being with us tonight. Let us start with the very first question, and that is, provide a summary of your experience that makes you a strong candidate for the position of chief of police, and why would you want to come to Fort Worth? Or maybe you should say, why not? Yes, that's right. That's right. It's a wonderful city. I just first want to start by saying thank you all. It is certainly a privilege being here and amongst the finalists in Fort Worth. You have a wonderful city. It is well managed. It's got a very responsive leadership and the community is very active and engaged and supportive of the police department. I have been on uh, with Houston Police Department for 29 years. I have been about 67 years in each rank. I have, uh, my current assignment is in patrol. I have five patrol divisions, about 1,000 officers serving approximately 1 million of our 2.3 million residents. I also have the mental health division that serves citywide residents. In my career, I've kind of been all over the org chart in investigations and patrol. I've been in uh, code enforcement where we looked at and enforced the automotive industry as well as uh, gambling locations. We also have looked at the illicit massage parlors and so forth. I've also worked with the citizens in that same capacity, as sort of a code enforcement capacity. With problematic officers, I've worked with the IAD uh, unit in a, a division in patrol. I have also worked with our early warning system, and I have been involved with uh, administrative personnel committee, which is uh, getting officers uh, in a uh, uh, to back to work who have been injured, and uh, whether it be on duty or off duty, and may have some mental health issues. Uh, I have a bachelor's of business from the University of Houston and a master's in sociology also from the University of Houston. I'm a wife and a mom. My husband Larry is a commander at the Houston Police Department, and our son Aaron is 22 and currently a senior at Texas A&M. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chief Bainbridge. And now I would like to introduce to you Chief Troy Gay, currently with the Austin Police Department, just about three hours down 35, short little trip to get here. Chief Gay, as you get ready to uh, take the microphone, we're beginning with the opening question, and that is we'd like to know a summary of your experience that makes you a strong candidate for the Chief of Police in Fort Worth, and why does Fort Worth appeal to you? Thank you so much for that question. And uh, before I get started, I just want to say uh, thank you for coming out. This is such an important uh, uh, decision that has to be made, and I'm just so thankful to be part of that process. I'm on my 34th year of law enforcement starting in Waco in 1987 and then moving to Austin in 1990. I have a broad lens of policing working in multiple assignments throughout all of different policing uh, divisions and units throughout the department. And over the last 14 years, I have been in a command and executive uh, role uh, for the Austin Police Department. Um, I have been to many uh, leadership schools, and most of all, over the last decade, I have led most of the innovative efforts uh, for our department. Uh, I'm a veteran of the United States Marine Corps Reserves. I have uh, uh, served in the desert, desert Storm in 1990. I was activated as a reservist there. Uh, I wanted to transition to just to let you know about me personally. Personally, I'm a man of faith. I am uh, a father of, of four 
uh, adult children. They told me when they said, make sure you say adult children. So they're, uh, and I have a, a granddaughter who is nine. Um, I have a wife that I have been married to for 34 wonderful years. And most of all is that I'm, I'm part of the community. I'm part of the community that, that I live in and I serve each and every day. Uh, I give you that uh, sort of round experience to say that all of my experience has molded me into who I am today, a, a man of integrity, a servant leader, a effective communicator, a mentor, and a, and a team player. I think that I am a, a good fit for this department because of my experience, uh, because I have led a department into the 21st century of policing, and I am so excited to uh, talk to you more tonight. Thank you. All right, and yes, and we will ask you many more questions tonight. Thank you so much, Chief Gay. Appreciate that. And now I would like to introduce you to from the candidate who comes from outside of the great state of Texas, and that is Assistant Sheriff Chris Jones is with us tonight from Las Vegas. So glad to have you with us, Assistant Sheriff Jones, as you make your way up to the microphone. We are asking each candidate right now to provide a summary of your experience that makes you a strong candidate for Chief of Police and why Fort Worth. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and for those of you who are watching as this is broadcast this evening. Uh, as she said, I'm Assistant Sheriff Chris Jones. I'm with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, although I come from out of state to this process, uh, I am a native Texan. I was born and raised in the Panhandle, and I attended school at Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas. A um, little about me personally, I'm happily married for 26 years. I have two adult children that are just amazing. Uh, and have since graduated college. Um, why Fort Worth? Uh, like I said, I'm a native Texan. Uh, I served uh, the Las Vegas community for the last 28 years uh, as, a, as very, in various positions with the police department. Um, I've made my way to the number three position of assistant sheriff, uh, and I've gained a tremendous amount of knowledge, experience, and education over those years in policing. Uh, Fort Worth is, is a community to me that has demonstrated they are still willing to sit down at the table with their police, and the police department is still willing to sit down at the table to work through the issues that we're seeing. Uh, that means a lot to me. Uh, there are cities, unfortunately, in the country that are just not willing to do that now, um, but Fort Worth is. And so I would like to bring my experience uh, in police reform, uh, my experience in reducing violent crime, and making our community a better place to live. Uh, if chosen for this position, I assure you, I would give you the same level of service uh, and, and level of commitment that I have done for the last 28 years as a law enforcement officer in Las Vegas, Nevada. In closing, I'd like to say thank you again. Uh, I know that each of you have something else you could be doing tonight. Uh, you could be with your families or, or anything else, but you chose to be here. You chose to be here because you care about the city of Fort Worth and you care about its police department. I appreciate that and I'd love to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Assistant Sheriff Chris Jones. And now coming into the room is another, a native of Fort Worth, works just a little to the east. He's here with us tonight, the Chief of Police from the Carrollton Police Department, Derek D. Miller is our next candidate. Chief Miller, thank you so much. As you make your way to the microphone, we're asking each candidate right now to take a moment to provide a summary of your experience that makes you a strong candidate for the job of chief in Fort Worth and why Fort Worth. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you for everyone coming out and participating in this process. Thank you to Mayor and Council, uh, Mr. Cook, Mr. Chapa, for giving us this opportunity. My name is Derek Miller. I uh, am the husband of, to Wendy and the father to Addison and Austin. Uh, that's my greatest uh, achievement. Uh, to date. Uh, I am currently uh, serving as the Chief of Police in the City of Carrollton. Before I got to the, uh, the City of Carrollton, I grew up on the west side of Fort Worth. I attended Monning Middle School and then went to Western Hills High School and then from there went on to UTA where I got a bachelor's degree in criminology and criminal justice and a master's degree in criminology and criminal justice as well. Uh, 
I entered the police service in 1993 as a police officer, actually as a reserve police officer, and worked my way up through every rank and position in the Carrollton Police Department. It's one of my greatest accomplishments professionally. The Carrollton Police Department is an amazing police department filled with amazing people who we have created a leaderful organization that is community engagement, is the central theory for us to practice law enforcement. We try at every chance we get is to engage the community where they are. Some of the strengths that I'll bring to you in Fort Worth are my ability to build relationships and formulate teams. I'm an active listener, and I know that we can make Fort Worth an even greater city than it is today. I want to thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to answering your questions, and hopefully we get to meet and talk afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chief Miller. And now, please welcome one of two candidates from within the Fort Worth Police Department, Neil Noakes. Another Charlton graduate here, another connection to Charlton State University. Good evening. Good evening, Chief Noakes. Thank you. As you make your way to the microphone, we're asking each candidate that if you would take a moment to tell the audience a summary of the experiences you bring that will make you a strong, that makes you a strong candidate for Chief of Police, and also why Fort Worth? Why, for, why Fort Worth? That's the easy part. Uh, I don't just want to be a police chief. I'm not looking for a title. I want to be the police chief in the city of Fort Worth. I have the great fortune of serving alongside some of the best men and women you will find anywhere, every single day. And when I say that, I'm talking about the officers that are out there doing the job every single day. I'm talking about our civilian employees. I'm talking about our volunteers. And I'm talking about the citizens that we're here to serve in the first place. For me, this isn't about a job. This is about leading my family, my Fort Worth family. And that encompasses all of us. And what I think qualifies me more than anything as a candidate for this job is my past work, what I have been doing in the department, what I've been doing in the city, in the communities. I spend a lot of time building relationships, not because I'm better than anyone else, but that's where my heart is. My heart is with the officers. My heart is with the community. There is a divide between all of us right now. The only way we fix that is if we come together, and that's what I want to do. I want to be the one that bridges that gap, because if we want to deal with the issues we're all facing, let's look at the core root problems of crime in the first place. None of us can do it alone. But if we all come together, we work collaboratively in partnership-based relationship policing, we're not going to arrest our way out of the problem, but working together, we can absolutely make a difference, and I would be thrilled to death if I was able to get the chance to do just that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chief Noakes. And our sixth finalist for police chief in Fort Worth, also coming to us from within the Fort Worth Police Department, is Julie Swearingen. Julie, as you make your way up to the microphone, we are asking each candidate to take a moment to give us a summary of your experiences that makes you a strong candidate for police chief, and why do you want to be chief of Fort Worth? Okay, thank you. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, why Fort Worth? Um, I've committed the last 25 years to this department, this city, and I believe the experience of the 25 years working in the different units and promoting each rank has prepared me for this next step. Um, I believe this is an incredible city. We have uh, community members that truly care about our department and our city, and we want to work together with them. Um, what I bring is someone who's worked hard to get to where I'm at. I've climbed through the ranks. I've promoted. Um, a little bit about my story. Um, I'm a little bit of the underdog. I was a pregnant 17-year-old dropout, and I've worked very hard to get where I am today in, in getting through the obstacles and challenges. So. What I bring is my people skills, my ability to connect, and to hopefully connect to the communities that we're having trouble uh, repairing, trusting with the city and the relationship with the police department. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Swearingen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've gotten a first look at our six finalists for Chief of Police, the men and women who, one of them, 
will lead our city of 900,000. I want to, and again, to each of you, thank you very much for your many years of service that you've given to your respective cities and to your residents and for what you do within your departments and for the families you leave behind every day to go serve your cities. We do appreciate what you do. As I explained earlier, the questions that we asked tonight come straight from the community. These are the questions that have been submitted on behalf of residents, what the residents wanted to know of each of you. The questions that came in will boil down to the top six categories, and that's what we'll focus on tonight. For those of you in the room and those of you watching through virtually, I want to let you know each candidate will have two minutes to answer the question. We do have a sort of a timekeeper here on the front row that our finalists know to look at. We're not gonna drag anybody off the stage if they go over the two minutes. We'll let them finish their thoughts. But I just wanna let you know we're not gonna let anybody kinda hog the conversation. And and I'm probably doing that right now, so I better go ahead and move on. All right, so we are going to begin with our first question, and we will go in the way that you were introduced in the beginning, alphabetical order down the row. So Chief Bainbridge, we will start with you. The first question coming from our community has to do with crime reduction. It's one question, but it's in three parts, okay? So you'll get 12 minutes, you'll get two minutes to answer, I'll lay it all out to you. Like many cities across the country, Fort Worth has experienced an extreme increase in homicides and violent crime. What do you believe are the major factors that have led to this increase? What are you proposing to address these increases, also recognizing there are constraints on the police budget? And while you are reducing violent crime, how do you keep a reduction on nonviolent crimes. Very good. Okay, can you hear me? Um, very good question, so important and you're right. Uh, it is hitting every major city across this nation, this violent crime upsweep. Um, Fort Worth has seen a 60% rise in murders and a 40% rise increase in aggravated assaults and half of that has been due to domestic violence. Regarding the murder increase, it's been a nexus to robberies, gangs, narcotics, and to simple people just being angry. You see an increase of those type of incidents, like road rage, for example. And so you would handle them differently. Um, I believe in a collaborative approach, whether it be looking at crimes, reducing calls, and you gotta look at it both the same to be efficient. If you're talking about crime, you have to uh, work and get the intelligence on what's going on within those gangs. Who are the shot callers within those robbery crews? And that takes intelligence. That takes looking at more than just data. Get with your DA's office, get with the feds, the federal prosecutors, and also get with your, your state and federal agencies regarding enforcement. When you collaborate and see things from uh, various perspectives, you have a more permanent resolution. Get in and dismantle those gangs. You can see how we can arrest and arrest and have all of these uh, felonies arrest but never reduce crime that's because who are you arresting are you really making an impact on those crews that are doing the, the robberies for example um, I believe in uh, aggravated assaults uh, looking at the domestic violence very difficult for law enforcement to positively impact that but there are some things that you can do in our experience we have uh, what's called a lethality assessment where we're working with uh, our victims assistants and we're asking those particular questions on a lethality assessment uh, because oftentimes we'll talk to our victims and we'll say, you know where this is going, it's gonna get worse and worse and they don't really believe us, they think that you know, this is just what police say. But when they see it and answer all of those questions and they can see where their life is headed, it really changes things and we have seen a reduction in recidivism to calls to those type of those houses where these uh, usually women have completed these assessments. Those assessments go to a victims of services for a follow up. Uh, we are now deploying um, officers, co-deploying officers with victims assistance to the domestic violence calls. While the officers are handling the, uh, the crime part of that, the social part of that, it's also social and crime problem, is being handled with that victim's assistance. They're getting them into shelter that night helping with the kids and helping with the animals because oftentimes those are the first ones in the home that are being abused. It's a holistic approach and we're seeing some pretty positive results from that. It's in its infancy, but we have to look outside of what our normal deployment methods are for, again, for a more permanent resolution. Um, regarding um, 
your other types of calls. Look at your calls that are non-police related. And if you can do something about them, then you can allow your police officers to then focus more on crime. It's more efficient. There's not a chief across this country that will say, I've got enough, I'm, I'm, I'm my two minutes, I'm sorry, I could talk forever. But you kind of get the idea. It's a collaborative approach of both the crime problems and the non-call for uh, calls for service that don't have anything to do with crime. Thank All you. Right. Thank sorry you, Chief Bainbridge, yes. <laughs> All right, to you, Chief Gay, I'll ask the question once again. It's, again, it focuses on crime reduction. Like many cities across the country, Fort Worth has experienced an extreme increase in homicides and violent crime. So our community wants to know, what do you believe are the major factors that have led to this increase? What do you propose to reduce violent crime, yet also understanding the tight budget constraints? And how do you also keep a lid on the non-violent crimes or you address the homicides? Thank you, Deborah. Whoa. Um, thank you, Deborah. Uh, that is a great question. I know Wendy already went over the statistics for the crime and that, uh, that we're having to face that. I'm going to focus on the collaborative approach that, that she really mentioned, is that you, a police department cannot do it alone. It has to be a collaborative approach, and we have to come up with solutions. The way that I uh, like to look in uh, and how I would address crime is is really data driven you, you have to look at the data you have to see what it says you have to employ uh, intelligence led policing and using evidence based strategies I mean there, there's good strategies out there I could go over hotspot policing which is just one strategy that is really talking about uh, going to a particular location but it's, it's giving your officers clear direction in reference to what they're to do and making sure that they are uh, doing the attended consequences that you want them. Too often there's the zero tolerance and folks go in and then there's unintended consequences for those uh, type of strategies. You need to look at that, you need to develop your strategies with your community and in a collaborative approach. So I would really look at uh, doing a data-driven approach. I would look at our, the technologies that are out there that would help our investigators. I would look at the organizational structure at how the units are, are organized and how they're designed and are we set up for success. And most of all is that the community needs to have a voice uh, in, in how to address crime. Uh, it's a force multiplier. The police department is only a small segment of the community, but together by creating tip lines, two-way communications, there are ways that, uh, that we can work together. Crime can be solved if we have trust and legitimacy and we're working together on the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Gay. In the interest of time, Assistant Sheriff Jones, do you need me to repeat the question that's kind of? No, it's okay. Okay, all right. Uh, so Sorry, a lot, of, a lot of good points made. I do agree with the evidence-based policing, the intelligence-led policing. That data is gonna tell you exactly where your problems are, and that intelligence-led policing is gonna tell you exactly who is causing your problems, who, what is driving that crime in that particular area. And so I would add uh, to what e each of the candidates have said that um, the, the major factors to me are a combination of things. We've all lived through this last year. We know what is causing uh, the tension. We know what's causing um, uh, the quickness to, to act out um, through violence rather than work things out uh, in a civil way. Uh, we've been cooped up. We're tired of COVID. Employment's up. All of those factors contribute to uh, the violence that we've seen in every single city across the United States. And so with respect to the murderers, uh, I believe that there is a crime prevention plan for every causational factor of, of murders, uh, be it domestic violence, uh, be it gangs, be it narcotics. There's, there's a plan that we can put in place as police along with the community to address every, every single one of those causative factors. And first and foremost, it's to partner with the community. If we're partnering with the community, if we're doing everything we can to build that trust within our communities, uh, those crime numbers will fall in place. The community will trust us, they will report to us, they will give us information. We know um, from experience that we have to solve uh, 
the shootings and the violent crimes that don't result in murder and we will have a direct impact on murders. A person who gets away with one shooting that doesn't kill someone will do another shooting and will lead to another shooting. And so by solving those, what we refer to as failed murders, we get the shooters off the streets. We get the guns off the streets. Uh, we we uh, put a plan in place to deal with the issues that are happening behind closed doors in domestic violence. Uh, by co-responding, giving those wraparound services to the victims. Um, and we do all of this in cooperation with other agencies, with other uh, um, non-governmental agencies, um, because it's been said before, we can't do it alone, and certainly the budget is not gonna support it. So uh, a number of things we can do in Fort Worth, we've done them in Las Vegas, and I would bring that experience here to this city and be successful. Thank you so much, Assistant Sheriff Jones. Chief Miller, would you like for me to repeat thank you, the question? Thank you so much. I think the factors that are causing crime, we can look to the literature to find out what some of those things are. There's a whole host of sociological and criminological theories that speak to what we're going through now in our society. Um, the inability to attain um, um, certain things, a variety of goals in society, I think, causes strain. And these strains and stressors sometimes, sometimes lead to crime. Multi-generational poverty. Uh, underperforming uh, 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 social institutions, um, uh, things of that nature are contributing to these issues. So work needs to be done in this space before we can have a positive impact on, on the crime issues. Think about it. If you look at the report of crime in Texas that came out in 2019, over 690,000 people were arrested in the state of Texas. There are 28 million people in the state of Texas. In all of Texas, 690,000 people are arrested. Over 70% of those people were arrested for the second time. So if we look at who is offending, who's offending, the causational effects, we will come to the conclusion that the law, law enforcement by themselves cannot tackle this problem. The, the, the way to address it is we need to collaborate with social services to try to help uh, people get on their feet to relieve some of these strains and stressors. If you look at housing and how being able to attain housing, the African American community, the number one, uh, one of the main factors is a high loan denial to be able to, to get into a home. 33% of the people getting the home spend almost 30% of their, of their income on homes. 15% spend over 50% of their total income on housing. So strains, economic strains, the inability to attain goal, uh, uh, middle class goals, all have factors in the causation of crime. The police department by itself can't tackle these problems. So we need a holistic approach, bringing the community along with us, using all the strategies that the other candidates have spoken about, our strong professional approaches to how to handle crime, but we cannot do it by ourselves. We have to listen to the community, we have to figure out what the real issues are before we can even have an impact on it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Miller. To you, Chief Noakes, same question. We're seeing homicides at a rate in Fort Worth that we haven't seen in a quarter century. It's a trend that's going on nationwide, but if you ask people in Fort Worth, they don't care about the nation so much with the crime rate. They care about the place they live. Not that they don't care about the country, but they want their own homes and neighborhoods to be safe. So what we're doing in Fort Worth is addressing those concerns. Uh, we've heard some great things about different data-driven strategies, and we absolutely do those. We've heard some amazing things I'm glad Chief Miller brought up about the societal issues that contribute to this. The food deserts we see, the underperforming schools, resources that are needed but aren't there. The generational neglect we've seen in a lot of communities contributes to this. We've got some amazing men and women in the Fort Worth Police Department that go out every day and do their best to address the violent crime. And I commend them for the work they do. What we're trying now is to reach out even further to the community. Uh, one of the best things I heard about uh, zero tolerance or saturation details, which is an old method that used to be used. If the police department goes into a neighborhood and the only tool they have on their tool belt is a hammer, everybody starts to look like a nail. And that means we're targeting even the citizens we're trying to serve. So we don't do that in Fort Worth. We use focused deterrence where we actually go into the communities specifically dealing with the people involved with the violence. Something else we're doing, uh, actually Chief Krause and I talked about this recently, it was an idea I pitched to him and it looks like it's going to happen. A lot of times the only difference between an aggravated assault and a homicide is a little bit of luck. 
Oftentimes the people who are doing the shootings who are causing these aggravated assaults are our shooters and the homicides as well. The problem is the detectives working those are so overloaded with their cases in general assignment and as you pointed out, they're also dealing with property crimes. What we want to put together is a team designed specifically to deal with non-fatal shootings. A team that doesn't have to deal with the property crimes, we will let the detectives in the general assignment deal with that. But we put the same resources, we put the same training, and we put the same investigative power into investigating the non-fatal shootings. And in doing so, we will be preventing some of the homicides that are happening right away. So that's a way to have more of an immediate impact. It's a program that's being done in Denver, and they have seen a significant increase in their clearance rates on their aggravated assaults, and we expect to see the same kind of results here in Fort Worth. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Noakes. And same question for you, Chief Swearingen. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I think everyone has spoke to kind of the things that I was going to talk about, so I'll come with a different approach. Um, yes, violent crimes have increased and homicides, um, but how about we work to prevent that? We can uh, use resources we have and, and cross-train them and put them in different places. You know, yes, we can have uh, add homicide detectives to investigate cases, prevent retaliation. But how about as a community, we work together to prevent these types of crimes that are occurring in our city? And how do we do that? Is we build trust with the community members. We get back to the old beat concept. Uh, think of it from grassroots. You know, if I have a beat, I know who lives in my beat, and I develop a relationship with you, and I build that trust with you. That way you're apt to report something that you don't see. You know exactly what's going on in your community, what cars are there, what cars don't belong there. So we need to work together to build that trust. And I know this is going to take time, but I think we need to get there. Because again, I, we don't want to be reporting crimes and responding after the fact. How about we prevent them? You know, um, and again, I, I know the data shows that we do um, what we're doing for violent crime right now. We are doing. Um, details and targeting gun violence in some of the areas that have the, uh, the violent crimes. We uh, deploy officers when uh, staffing allows to kind of do a, a aggressive beats to look for some of these uh, criminals and make arrests. Um, but again, I, I think the answer is working together as a community and building that trust again so we can work together because crime is going to increase. Um, until we say enough is enough together and we work together to combat it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chief Swearing Jim. That was again our first topic, crime reduction. Number one topic, or one of the big topics from our audience, our community questions. Now we're moving on to the next topic that our residents wanted to know about and that is community-oriented policing. We want to know about your approach to promoting the concept of community-oriented policing throughout the police department. From your knowledge, what does the Fort Worth Police Department do well? And what changes would you like to make to the current program, including neighborhood police officers? And this time we're going to start with you, Chief Gay. Thank you, Deborah. Um, my philosophy on community policing or in policing in general is, is around two concepts, and that is procedural justice as well as collaborative policing. I believe that uh, I do know that uh, a few years ago the Fort Worth Police Department uh, had a procedural justice unit and actually uh, trained all their officers in procedural justice, so I think that is a very positive. I also know that in some of the reports that have uh, been pushed out from the police expert panel on their, their preliminary reports really talks about um, community policing. So I, I'm going to sort of go into a lane of saying is that one is that I don't believe community policing or policing in, in the aspect of procedural justice as well as a coordinated effort is, is one unit's job. I think it's the, it should be uh, woven into every officer's uh, duty and responsibility to serve the community that they are part of. And I say that because our officers should be part of the community that we serve. They should show up each and every day. They should be part, I know Julie mentioned it, about bringing the fabric of the neighborhood officer. Your officers should show up 
and take the call, but take an extra couple minutes during that call to ask how they're doing, to ask if there's anything else that they can do. This is bigger than something on a poster in a wall. This is something that should be in the fabric of, of the DNA of each officer. And, and that is the type of officer and the expectations that I would lead from the front to be present, visible, engaged each and every day to lead this department to be more of a community engaged, a community policing department. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Chief Kay. Assistant Sheriff Jones, your answer to the question. Thank you. Uh, so I'll start with, with, you know, there are a number of definitions out there for community-oriented policing. Um, some people define it as, you know, coffee with a cop or, or uh, you know, Tuesday meetings or what, what have you. But in reality, those are just elements that, that help to build relationships between the police and the community. To me, the definition of community policing is the police working uh, collaboratively with citizens and with community leaders so that the citizens become stewards of their own community and we the police serve as guardians and that's what our police officers have to understand they are guardians in those communities and I was asked earlier today how um, how we promote community oriented policing and how we get officers to buy into the concept and the way we do that is we allow them to see uh, the successes of it we allow them to see the kids who are out playing in the street, the people who come up to them in the neighborhoods and tell them about what crimes have occurred and who's committing those crimes. And once officers see that, uh, they understand it and it becomes the culture of the department because they see the successes of it. They see how it makes them feel inside uh, because I know each and every one of the Fort Worth police officers uh, want to feel that way and strive to feel that way every day. They serve this community well uh, and I know that they have a, a number of community-oriented policing practices in place with the neighborhood officer uh, program. Uh, what would I, part of the question was what would I do differently? Um, the biggest issue is uh, making sure that, that our officers um, go out there every single day with a servant heart and there's, there's uh, bias-based training, um, there's uh, training that we can put them through that that allows them to understand how they can start programs within a community, how they can be sort of that uh, collective effort that brings a community together uh, and gives back to that community. Our officers have to understand that it's their job to give to the community rather than take from. And so through all of those programs and, and through developing community policing programs, uh, encouraging that, making it part of the Fort Worth uh, police officers culture, uh, they see those successes and the community will see those successes in, in, the, um, in a sense of crime reduction uh, and, a, and a safer place to live. Thank you so Thank you. much, Assistant Sheriff Jones. To you, Chief Miller. Thank you. Uh, community policing to me is quite simple. It's law enforcement coming together with the community to solve substantive problems. Um, but this presupposes that the police department has a relationship with the community. Uh, in, our, in my department, we've been very successful of collaborating and fostering relationships in the city that would allow us to further our community engagement. Every officer is, is inculcated in our, into our fiber that community engagement is everyone's job. It's every police officer's job. It can't be coalesced in a unit or a few programs. Programs can ac accelerate the idea of community policing. Um, the Fort Worth Police Department does an amazing job with its NPO units, its crime awareness uh, of folks in every patrol division, its POW program, it's, it's school resource officers, gang in, intervention. There's a myriad of things that the Fort Worth Police Department are doing that are extremely, extremely effective. What we would do different, perhaps, maybe make sure that we're focused. NPOs on the north side should be making sure that the services that they're providing, although different and tailored to the particular side of town, are also being mirrored on the south side. What's happening on Amanda Street is happening on Las Vegas, at Las Vegas Trail. What's happening on the north side is happening on the south side. And these things will become, over time, a culture for the police department. It also starts with leadership. Community engagement, the idea of community engagement has to be exhibited and modeled by the leaders of the organization or the culture will not change. Change will take time. And we have to make sure and we have to tell our police officers that it's okay. It's okay to stop and try to figure out what the problems are 
and then use the resources of the department through units and initiatives to try to figure out the best way forward to solve substantive problems. Crime will only exist because there's offenders, victims, and locations. And so once you identify what the problems are, the real problems, it's then you can deploy strategies that you can try to curb the issues, but then you have to measure to make sure that you're getting a return on your investment with the strategies. So thank you. Thank you, Chief Miller. To you, Chief Noak, same question regarding community-oriented policing. Thank you. Community policing is not a program. Community policing is a mindset. There are programs in the Fort Worth Police Department that support the community policing mindset, but for community policing to work, it has to permeate the entire department and everything we do. It's important for officers to understand when they're out in the community that every single interaction they have with the citizen is a chance for a positive engagement or it's a chance for a negative engagement. It's a chance to change the narrative. It's a chance to create a relationship. We have to be more intentional in law enforcement in general about creating opportunities for those positive engagements. We cannot wait for the community to come to us. It is up to us to go to the community. We can't always expect the community to agree with everything we say. If we only go to communities that agree with us and already like the Fort Worth Police Department, we're not doing our job fully. We have to be willing to have hard conversations. We have to be willing to be in communities all across the city regardless of zip code and give them the same exact kind of professional, compassionate, empathetic service that we would give anyone else. Everyone deserves it. I see every day officers that do make these interactions with citizens, and they don't have to be anything large. It could be something small. But it's the fact that they took the time to get to know someone. It's the fact that they took the time to maybe have that hard conversation and bring someone into their, their own personal space. One of the things that I think we could change, because we do a great job here in Fort Worth PD, but we could always do better. We have some amazing NPOs. I think sometimes the NPO position has been a bit watered down. They've become maybe a bit of a jack of all trades at times. And it's not done because anyone is trying to sabotage the program, it's done out of necessity. If there's something that needs to be done and no one else is around, oftentimes the NPOs are the ones to do it. I think we need to get back more towards focusing completely on community policing across the department, but also allowing to do, the MPOs to do what the program was designed to do in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Noakes. And to you, Chief Swearingen, same question. Okay, thank you. So community policing is a partnership, and as they've mentioned, we can't do this alone. The police department cannot do this alone. And what we do good as a, as a department is we do have our NPO programs um, and we do have community programs as uh, Chief Miller mentioned, and all those are great. Um, I'll go back to what I said about we're building trust. You're gonna hear us, most of us say, it's about building trust with the community and gaining that respect and that support. Um, I'll go back to the B concept. So we, we have an MPO and he's tasked with uh, the community piece and, and building the bridges and, and having community meetings, but just think, what about if we had a team? So we, your area, you have a day shift officer, a second shift officer, and a midnight shift officer. What about if we had a team? So those four along with that MPO, they're the ones who are out there trying to meet the members of the community. You know, and, I, and I say knocking on doors, but what I mean is just actually getting to know the community members in their area that they police. You know, we talked about um, having the citizens gain that trust and maybe reach out to them and report crimes or activities they see. So if you have a team of this four that could work together to go out there and start getting into their area of responsibility, they'll have a sense of ownership and pride in that area. And then the citizens, again, will build that relationship with their officers. Also, we have probably 242 House of Worships in, uh, in Fort Worth. Use those resources. Use the church members, the community members, and, and other types of organizations. Have them hold meetings to introduce them to this, this team of four that can build a relationship. And, uh, can really explore other options on building community relationships. I mean, we can do a lot of research. You can, you can search and find programs and what we can bring to Fort Worth. Um, but I think we need the community to help us do that, help us in, in repair that relationship, help us find programs that work for the community, um, help us that's gonna prevent crime, getting the community members the resources and the help that they need to be productive citizens. 
Thank you so much, Chief Swearingen. And to you, Chief Bainbridge, the question regarding community-oriented policing, what is your answer? Boy, I don't like going last. <laughs> what they said. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> going to get to go last at some point. We're moving this down um, the road. So I'm going to reiterate something that, uh, you know, neighborhood-oriented policing in, in, uh, across this nation began in uh, shoot, probably the 80s, and then it became problem-oriented policing, which is working with uh, the citizens and code enforcement and targeting problematic locations to reduce the crime. And now it's relational policing because we see that it can't just be um, that one neighborhood officer, which, by the way, Fort Worth does that very well. I was under Chief Cross's leadership. You all have done an amazing job in meeting your public and, and their demands and exceeding those demands and working with them. I think um, it is incumbent upon all of us. Can you imagine not just the neighborhood officer, but from the chief on down, seeing it through the prism of every interaction, every traffic stop, every witness statement that you're obtaining, every call for service, that even at lunch when you're going out, that and they see that uniform and you're talking to them, it's the chance to see that you are fair, you are impartial. It develops that trust. That trust is what keeps you safe because then we'll have knowledge of what's going on. Too often that trust is just not there, sadly and we don't have the understanding of what's really driving the crime. And so that's, that's crucial that it's 1,700. There's other things that you can do. They, the community, they also need to feel like they're part of that crime resolution. They, they don't want to feel like a victim. They want to they wanna know that they're taking part and they're working with you because uh, they want that control over their lives and they deserve that. So that relationship must take place. Uh, what you can do internally, you can change the award system and add a, add a relational policing award. You can add a community policing award. You can, um, that will in, give officers an incentive to keep doing that and keep developing that trust. And lastly, what you can also do is add proactive policing on your work card. And so they can get uh, that point, if you will, and that they're doing something, they're stopping and doing that proactive engagement between their calls for service. I see I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Bainbridge. Okay, you can breathe. We're a third of the way through the questions, all right? Six categories, we're a third of the way through. All right, all right, now we move on to another key area that our audience, our community members wanted to know, and that's the topic of building community trust, accountability. As you know, building trust with the community is fundamental to effective policing, and accountability is seen as a big factor in the city's next chief. This is one question with a few parts. Describe how you ensure and assure our communities that those who protect and serve will be held accountable. And in your answer, specifically address allegations of excessive force and officers being rude and are unprofessional when dealing with certain community members. Provide an example of your experience addressing these types of situations. I'll go through it one more time. This is the topic of accountability. Describe how you ensure and assure our communities that those who protect and serve will be held accountable. In your answer, specifically address allegations of excessive force, officers being rude and unprofessional when dealing with certain community members, and give us an example of your experience in addressing these types of situations. This time we begin with you, Assistant, Chief, Assistant Sheriff Jones. Well, thank you very much. Obviously a, a hot topic um, as we've seen the events over this last year. Um, so how do I ensure that our officers will be held accountable? First off, it starts with very strong, uh, solid policies. Uh, clear policies that the officers understand, uh, that they get trained on, uh, and that they go out on the streets with an expectation that they follow those policies. Uh, once you have those policies in place, you make sure that your matrix is, your discipline matrix is in place uh, and that your internal affairs has the authority and answers to a high enough authority within the police department to make sure that uh, those layers are removed. It shouldn't have, internal affairs shouldn't be buried down in deep in the department uh, because every layer takes from that. There's filtering going on. And so uh, making sure that internal affairs reports to a high enough the authority in the department uh, with policies in place with culture built throughout the department um, and then you hold the officers accountable uh, officers are going to make mistakes we're human 
Uh, we have to understand that, accept that, and we have to differentiate between it's a, when it's a training issue versus something that the officer's done that violates a serious policy. Um, with uh, respect to execu exec uh, excessive force uh, being rude and unprofessional, uh, you policize it, you train your officers, you set a culture, you set an expectation, and when they're sustained for violating those policies, you hold them accountable. Discipline's there to change behavior. Um, we cannot allow, we can no longer allow that uh, to not be in place. Officers have to understand that through procedural justice, you treat everyone equally. You apply the law equally across the board. You apply the law uh, with professionalism. It's in the, the values of, of, in the, of the Fort Worth Police Department. Um, and you, you make sure that uh, when you have a problematic officer, they're dealt with. Uh, I think we're, we're making headway in that. Um, arbitrators uh, are starting to see that you can no longer give an officer back a job or lessen the discipline uh, for an officer who has been charged with something a number of times. I know that Fort Worth police officers go out there every single day to make a difference. I've met several of them, and I know that they are 99.9% .9 the representation of all the police officers on this department. But what I have to do as the chief is I have to make sure when we do find that one officer uh, in the 1700 or those few officers, we hold them accountable, um, we get, get rid of them if we have to, but we make them understand that, that violations of policy and treating people wrong and using excessive force will not be tolerated. Because this is such an important topic, to our community. I'm gonna ask for 30 seconds, 30 more seconds on the clock, please. The, the, the other part of this question, um, Assistant Chief Chair Jones, that the community wanna know was an example of your experience addressing this type of situation. Sure. Um, currently, Internal Affairs reports directly to me as the number three person in charge of the department uh, where I work at Las Vegas Metro. Uh, I would ensure that that is in place. Um, an example of that is, I mean, I've had to fire a number of officers. I've had to discipline a number of officers. Um, but I've also sent officers for retraining. Um, we have to follow procedural justice as we deal with the department uh, or with the officers, and we have to follow it within our department. Um, I could give example after example of, of disciplined officers, but I think uh, the most important thing is you, you have those things in place. And as chief, you make sure that everybody is following those, those procedures and those policies um, and holding people accountable. Okay, thank you very much, Assistant Sheriff Jones. To you, Chief Miller, the same topic, accountability. Uh, Peter Drucker has, has taught us that culture will eat strategy for breakfast and policy for lunch. What's needed in this space is absolute crystalline direction set by the leadership of an organization that certain behaviors will not be tolerated. What needs to be extended that idea are procedures and structures within inside an organization that ensures that police departments are doing exactly what they say they're doing. In my police department, we specifically have set up a compliance section that ensures that what we're doing with respect to the review of use of force, with the to the review of, of in internal audits and inspections are where we need to be doing and we're doing what we say we're doing. When we have to find, when we uh, have situations where ex force is being used, an extensive review of the force needs to be undertaken to ensure that the policies that were in fact were followed. If there are issues and retraining needs to take, or maybe there's failings in policy, those things need to be figured out. In those cases where there has been misconduct and force have been excessive, it is it's not tolerable. It's not tolerable. Excessive force. Take, takes down everything, every bit of trust that we're all talking about, it erodes it. So specifically, when policies are violated and misconduct occurs, then officers need to be separated and held accountable. We've unfortunately had to handle this in my police department where we have disciplined officers and had to separate officers for excessive force. Um, and unfortunately, with some of our systems and state laws, those officers are put back to work. Um, Police officers come to work every day to serve the public, but it's our responsibilities as leaders that we are holding ourselves accountable. I'm not afraid to say that um, having a monitor, an external monitor that reports to the, the management of the city to ensure that the police department is doing what they say they're doing is a, is a good thing. 
I think the idea needs to be extended. But to answer the question specifically, intensive review and outside and outside um, look into the police department to make sure that the policies are in fact being policies. The piece about uh, being discourteous to the public, um, I don't have a word for that. I can tell you what we did in Carrollton. We came up with a mission statement that specifically tells officers what we expect them to do and how they expect to treat, we expect them to treat the public. We will proactively protect our community, but we, everyone we encounter, we will treat with professionally, dig, professionalism, dignity, and respect. These ideals and values are sacrosanct. They're sacred. And that comes from me, the top, and it's, it, it's inculcated down into the organization. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chief Miller. To you, Chief Noakes, the question about accountability. I find it extremely troubling and extremely unfortunate that a, a very small fraction of those who go out and serve every day commit acts that shine a negative light on the entire department, but that's, that's the way it is. It's unfortunate that we have so many officers doing so many great things every day, but their work isn't necessarily seen because of the acts of a few. One thing we have to be crystal clear on is the expectation. Clarity has to precede accountability. So we have to be absolutely clear first, but once we are, we have to hold people accountable. If we don't, then there's no reason to follow the rules. One of the issues that came up from the panel of experts that reviewed our policies and procedures was that we had good policies in place, but we weren't necessarily always following them. That's a problem. That's something Chief Krause has addressed. That's something we will continue to address. Something else they said is sometimes officers not only didn't de-escalate, but seemed to maybe escalate a situation. Once again, unacceptable. We asked, were asked about excessive force and rudeness. The fact of the matter is one often precedes the other. If an officer shows up and is rude, there's more of a chance that that's going to turn into a use of force that wasn't necessary. And let me tell you a success story we've had. There was an officer through our standard mechanism of reviews of body cameras, there was a concerning incident that happened. Luckily, it did not result in excessive force, but it came close. For no real reason, he was rude to the person he was dealing with. Well, that person got rude back. That's human nature. And it got really close to maybe turning into a use of force. Luckily, there was another officer on scene who stepped in, which was amazing, first of all, to see. We have a duty to intervene. We have a duty to intervene in situations like that. This officer did. But what we did when we saw the concerning behavior, we pulled the officer out of patrol, and we put him in prescribed training at the police academy to retrain him on de-escalation, on compassion, on empathy, on emotional intelligence. We put him through some scenario-based training. And then when he went back out into the field, he rode with a senior officer for a while. He rode with someone who was able to keep an eye on him, to help him out, and to make sure the officer understood the training. So it wasn't just training and released, we made sure the training stuck. And I'll be happy to report, I have seen no other complaints or no other concerning behaviors out of that officer whatsoever. That was a success. Thank you very much, Chief Noakes. To you, Chief Swearingen. Thank you. Um, kind of what everybody's already touched on, uh, again, and being last, um, there has to be clear understanding of what our policies are. Um, and what our expectations are as a police department from our, from our officers. Um, you know, as the panel of experts says, we have great policies, but getting them to follow those policies. So we have to be clear that those who don't follow the policies will be held accountable. But I also look at case by case. Um, is the misconduct just reckless and intentionally, or was the conduct uh, a mistake that we can retrain, we can counsel, and we can try to change the behavior of the officer? Um, I think that's an important factor. Um, we have a discipline matrix in place, and it matches the discipline with the conduct of the officer, and that's how discipline is served. Um, and I think we also need to look at um, educating our community on how our discipline process is. Um, in my position, I was able to put in place uh, the process for internal affairs, and it's online available for you to kind of educate and see what our, 
our discipline is and how a case is investigated. But I think it's important that the community members understand that process as well because we follow local government and we follow general orders. So sometimes when the discipline that we hand out doesn't match what your expectations, that'll give you a better understanding of what guidelines we're following. Um, rudeness, um, like Chief Neal said, it, it can escalate something really quick to an excessive force, and excessive force will not be tolerated. And so we train, we have communication classes, we um, how to better interact in stressful situations so these situations don't escalate. Um, an example I would give a rudeness complaint where I was able to use uh, a training. Um, I sat down with the officer and I said, I want you to see the video from your body-worn camera and look at your conduct and tell me how you feel about the conduct. You know, and, and just that short time that we reviewed and we talked about, he actually got it and he said, you know what, you're right, this could have been worse. Um, and he, he accepted the discipline that was handed down to him, but that's training, sitting down with them and letting him see it from a different perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Swearingen. Chief Bainbridge, to you, the question about accountability. Yes. Um, simply put, uh, the public will know that uh, you're, we're accountable through transparency. We need to tell them. Uh, we can do, be doing the best things, the right things, have the best policies, be, uh, policies, but unless that we show them and tell them this is what we're doing through transparency, then they'll never know it. And so we, we absolutely have to be transparent. Um, we unfortunately have had to let go of a lot of officers. I've been under uh, some that uh, some chiefs that didn't, and unfortunately that will fester and grow worse, and it becomes a problem. We have body cameras now. We have uh, supervisors that review those body cameras. If they see an officer being rude or cursing too much, stop it right there. Stop it right there and just tell them the expectations of, of the type of behavior that we need to have. People will meet or exceed expectations. You just have to be engaged. You have to watch them and you have to set them. You have to model them as well. Um, I feel like training is absolutely imperative but too often, especially in big city departments, we don't train enough. Uh, we can't lose these officers for eight hours going to the academy. So what we found is that to keep it consecutive, to train at roll calls, say we're having a, a roll call of 10 people, you have to have trainers on every shift that have been trained at the academy all across in all six of your stations. And then after roll call, they can say you and you go train at your day and you'll be there for an hour with basic type training on what to expect. You can have de-escalation training in a scenario-based environment. You can do that consistently because the trainers are right there on each and every shift at each and every station. You can do um, other types of training, building searches, things like that because oftentimes it's one and done. You learn it in the academy and then you lose it. And so you need to keep that consecutive. Your officers deserve it and so do your citizens. So I feel like that's where policy meets practice, is, is if it's consecutive. Um, I just feel, again, in circling back, uh, we can't have officers out there that have no command of themselves. That has to be stopped, and they need to be held to account. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Bainbridge. And Chief Gay, the final answer to this topic. Thank you, Deborah. As it's been mentioned, uh, policies, expectations, it's already been mentioned about culture, uh, sort of want to focus on the culture aspect is because we have to create a culture that of continued improvement. You, you, you've got to have a culture to where it's, it's okay to, to correct behavior. And you have to have a department that is always wanting to improve. Is that so often is supervisors sometimes don't want to hold someone accountable because it's a small thing. It was a one-time thing. Unfortunately, that one-time thing turns into two and three, and then as a department, we have a responsibility to, to get that person to the end of their career. But if you just would have held them accountable at a lower level, it may have never escalated or gotten to a, a higher level of a situation. Um, in Austin, we've had uh, police oversight since 2001. It has uh, given us a level of, of transparency and trust and, and, and oversight into our process and has, is holding us accountable. And I, I think that's needed. I think that that's okay. That's, that's the way that we do business. 
Um, in talking about excessive force, uh, Derek already said it, it, it shouldn't be tolerated. Excessive force in itself should not be tolerated. I do think that you have to have policies and most excessive force situations, you have to sort of look at the root cause of the officer and look at other incidents. And usually that goes back to others that have talked about it as not dealing with de-escalation. Should have never become a force situation to begin with. In Austin, we have a de-escalation policy. We hold officers accountable. I have set on discipline hearings to where it has, that all that has happened was a de-escalation that we have set measures and accountability measures to hold officers accountable uh, that are uh, not following their, their training, specifically de-escalation. Uh, there was an incident that where an officer, the force in itself was legal. It was something that was within policy. But I can tell you is that he used force in 24 seconds from making contact is that no de-escalation techniques were used. And so that officer was held accountable for that. You have to look at the whole incident holistically. You also have to treat people with dignity and respect. And in reference to the language piece, we have a policy to where it, you, you can't curse, you can't use foul language. What is that gonna get you? Is that you can use command and control techniques without using certain types of language which is only going to escalate situations. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chief Gay. And now we move to our next topic, and that is culture change. As you all have noted, and our community knows, policing across the country is in the midst of change. What is your experience with introducing cultural change to an organization? What changes do you believe are key to move the Fort Worth police forward and what role does the community play? It's one question with kind of three parts. What is your experience with introducing cultural change to an organization? What changes do you believe are key to moving the force in Fort Worth forward? And what role does the community play? And this time, Chief Miller, will begin with you, sir. So um, the Carrollton Police Department has always been a very efficient and effective police department. Um, when I took the reins of the department, we were a very traditional based, enforcement based police department. Um, but times were changing and sometimes that strategy had a tendency to disengage us from our public. So we had to change the entire culture of the police department from one that was focused on citations and arrests to one that was focused on community engagement and engaging with the community to solve substantive problems. We went about this in a very meticulous way. The first thing that we did was engage the community and we started sending the message that community engagement was everyone's job, every beat officer's job, every civilian's job, meeting the public where they were, trying to figure out what the substantive issues were that we could solve and then coming together in a collaborative way of doing that. We started programs that focused on our youth we started a junior police academy that, I'm sorry, we started a PAL program that focused on our elementary school age kids and a junior police academy focused on middle, age, middle school age kids to try to build and maintain trust in the community. We focused on our Hispanic community that before were so afraid of us because they, every, they thought every contact was going to end with the deportation. To now, we're having programs, we have a program called Unidos where the community is coming to our police department to, to fellowship with us and, and we have built strong relationships. We really weren't engaged with our African American community. And now that we are, we have relationships with NAACP and several African American sororities and fraternities that are stepping up and handling men mentorship of young African Americans. How do we do it specifically? Is it became the direction of the police department set by me. We talk about it, my command staff talked about it, and we have inculcated it into the entire community. The change that needs to occur here is just as simple as that, is we have, to, we have to model the behavior that we want to have our officers exhibit. Someone mentioned it earlier. We need to reward the behavior that we want out of our police officers. It's a very important thing and it can be done with, with time and, that we stay, and we stay the course about what the missions of the police department is. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Miller. To you, Chief Noakes. I love the, the fact that this question starts with culture change. 
And then the last part of the question brings the community in. When really the community ought to be the first thing we talk about when we talk about culture change. And that's the, the culture change I have pushed in our department uh, since I've been in leadership roles that allowed me to influence the work of the officers. And it comes back to what I mentioned earlier. We are not going to arrest our way out of crime. I don't like hearing officers ever say the phrase, it's not my job. If we're actually gonna do something about the crime that's long lasting, if we're gonna change the culture and the way we deal with the citizens, we have to understand that, you know what? If it's not our problem, whose is it? If it's not us, then who? If we can't change everything, it doesn't mean we can't change the things we should. So the culture change I'm talking about is specifically that community engagement. It's specifically listening to the community members. We need to do everything we can to show the community our heart, to show the community our commitment, to show the community that we care, but to do that, we've got to show up. We've got to, if we want to be part of the community, we have to be in the community. The culture that we want to see within the Fort Worth Police Department is one where we all work together, where it's not unusual for an officer, instead of maybe just sitting in his car outside of a store because there's been burglaries in the area, to get out and talk to someone, to get out and have a positive interaction with the citizen. And I think that's some of the things we could do more. Uh, it's something I would want to do as far as leading by example. Much like Chief Krause, my plan would be to be out in the community as much as I possibly could. He set a great example there, and that's where I would plan to spend as much time as I possibly could. So when we're talking about what role does the community play, they play a key role. They play an absolute key role in it because if we are all working together, if we're all rowing the boat instead of drilling holes in it, and we're all rowing in the same direction, we actually get things done. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Noakes. To you, Chief Swearingen, the question about culture change. Okay, I think um, we start with culture change in the very beginning with our new officers um, as their recruits in the academy. And one thing we've implemented is um, we have our community members come into the class while the officers are in training, while the recruits are in training, and they share their experience of what, how they interacted with the Fort Worth police officer, being it a positive experience or a negative experience. And what that does is it allows that new potential officer, that recruit, to see that one split second of a negative interaction sets the tone for everything else to follow. So that's one of the things, um, bringing them in to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, sharing their experience, and kind of seeing what the community member's expectation of the officers that are policing their areas. You know, uh, we also try to incorporate a field trip. Obviously, COVID has put a stop in some of our training, and that's a field trip where they can actually go out into the community and meet with some of the members and kind of hear their stories as well instead of just a small group. Um, we also uh, had a piece about a, a volunteer, um, an opportunity for them to participate in a food bank or something that gives back to the community. And I think that's important. You know, um, but we understand changing the culture of the recruits, our future officers, but what about the culture internally with our veteran officers? And so part of that is incorporating some of this training with them, with our veteran officers as well and having them actually have, speak to the community members when they come in during their training. We do training uh, every year and in incorporating some of that training. Another piece is uh, leading by example, like Chief Noak said. We have to lead by example, and, and Chief Krause has set that foundation for us. But then it goes to the supervisors that are out there um, supervising these young officers. I think part of a, a new supervisor's role is to also get some of this training and have the community interaction piece. So we're looking at creating a new supervisor program. So you will go through the same thing the new recruit's going through. You'll have an interaction with a community member. You'll have a, a field trip. You'll, go out to, you'll have to do some community service. And I think that's kind of a way to get back. Um, and, and we need the community. What is the community's role? Everything. Continue to be a part of our training program. We invite you into our procedure uh, patrol procedures, you train with our recruits and so you can see what's expected of them when they get out there. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Swearingen. Chief Bainbridge? Uh, yes, I, I think that um, culture change has got to be everybody coming together. And again, I'll go back to relational policing. It's going to happen one interaction at a time. There are certain things that you can do. For instance, uh, you have a Citizens Police Academy. 
bring it to the neighborhoods and begin with the one where we need to strengthen our ties with that community. Actually take it to them, take uh, mounted, take everything that you can out there. Take the scenario based incidents in a system so they can sit there and see what officers go through and develop that level of empathy with, with one another and have it talk to one another. It's very difficult for citizen police academies to make their way to the academy to hold those, uh, those meetings and so forth. Everyone is very busy. So we need to take it to them and need to foster those relationships so we can build trust. Again, every interaction, one interaction at a time with our community. Um, there's other places where we can change our culture and that's no longer working in silos. For those calls that we get repeatedly that are not crime related, such as mental health, work with our mental health authority and work on several programs and, and talk to the officers and how that benefits them. They need to see because a lot of officers think that it's just mission creep. It's not that at all. It's getting our, our citizens in connection with those um, services that they need the most and then it allows officers to then focus on crime. Every time you invest one officer, you should be getting the full-time equivalents back as a result of that engagement and that collaboration. I, I feel that um, the community trust, they, they will see that it'll grow, even if there, it's not a, um, even if it's not a mental health type uh, uh, issue with that community member, they'll see that and they'll know that their police department is working thinking of different programs, very innovative programs, so they can better meet the needs of that community. I can go on and on with those pro programs, but you see we can't work in silos, and we need to meet our community where they're at and start with those communities that have an issue with trust with us. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Bainbridge. For you, Chief Gay. Thank you, Deborah. Um, a culture change that I uh, helped to implement was the advancement of community policing, but. Uh, I'm really going to go another direction, and that's a culture change that I'm currently working on with the police department. Uh, and that is a, a culture that has an understanding towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think that is so important in today's environment, is that there needs to be a zero tolerance for any forms of discrimination or harassment. I. We have put our leadership team through, through training to broaden our lens from anything from undoing racism to groundwater analysis, working with consultants to really dive into looking at the culture of, of our agency. We've surveyed our agencies. We've, we've talked to community members and our officers. And I can tell you is that uh, we do need to look at our culture and change, but we can't do that until we acknowledge that there's a problem, that, that it's there. It's something that we have to expose our, our department to, our officers to, is that I can tell you is that I sat in, in a chair many, many uh, years ago and said, you know, it's them, it's not me. But I can tell you through education, through trying to understand, it's, it's trying to get deeper and trying to understand other people's experiences and if you can do that and really look and have dialogue, and I'm talking about dialogue that's difficult but necessary with communities of color, uh, it is, is important to create spaces so you can have that dialogue. Uh, I, we've all talked about and we've put our officers through fair and impartial policing, we've put them through a bias-based uh, policing, all the things that uh, you would check the box for, but it's going to take more than that. It's going to take the community and the police departments working together. Uh, we have an equity office. We've worked together with the equity office. We are putting an equity action plan together in order to work together with the community to address the culture that is, that is needed within our agency. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Gate. And finally, to you, Sheriff Jones. Thank you very much. So the pers first part of the question was, um, what experience do I have um, in cultural change, bringing cultural change to an organization? So uh, as a commander, um, a few years ago, we were seeing uh, an increase in our use of force, an increase in our officer-involved shootings, and uh, we knew we had to do something about it. So uh, in a proactive way, we brought in uh, the Department of Justice and the Centers for Naval Analysis and we participated in a collaborative reform effort uh, to tell us what we needed to do uh, to fix this problem. 
And at the time, there were 75 recommendations uh, that were put in place uh, through that collaborative reform. Uh, over the next year and a half, we instituted every single one of those uh, collaborative reform changes, 75 of them. Uh, at that time, it included duty to intervene, uh, de-escalation, uh, sanctity of life, so all of those elements uh, I've led through, I've put those into policy and I've overseen the, uh, the training that was instituted for officers uh, to be sure that, that they understand that uh, and they know what's expected of them when they go out on the street with respect to use of force and how to treat the public. Uh, once we instituted the changes, um, we also established a use of force review board that I currently chair. Uh, we look at every officer involved shooting uh, with this use of force review board that has four members of the community on there. And these are voting members of the community. They have a say in whether or not that use of force that the officers use uh, was justifiable and it, if it was necessary. And those are two different distinct things, being justifiable and being necessary. Uh, so that is uh, the experience that I have with bringing cultural change uh, to a major metropolitan police department. The second part of that question, and I'll do this quickly, is what changes uh, are needed uh, for moving forward. Uh, we need to listen to the community, and more importantly, we need to listen to our critics. They will tell us when we're getting it wrong. It's easy to listen to people that agree with us. It's easy to sit down at the table when we know we're gonna have a peaceful, uh, pleasant conversation, but that's not where we need to be uh, right now. We need to be sitting at the table with our biggest critics and truly listening to them. And lastly, the third part of that question, what role does the community play? The community has to be willing to come forward and tell us when we're getting it wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Jones. Okay, moving down to uh, topic number five. How y'all doing, good? You got, need, anybody need a new fresh water bottle? You're okay? All right, all right, here we go. Topic number five um, deals with officer recruitment, officer morale and support. This is two questions. We'll ask you one, the first one, and then we'll go and ask you the second one. That's probably the best way to do it. Because change in any organization is difficult, how do you implement change without negatively impacting officer morale? Because change in any organization is difficult, how do you implement change without negatively impacting officer morale? And Chief Noakes, we start with you. Something I think is universal for people, regardless of what their profession is, they, they want to be heard, they want to be understood. I think the best way to not negatively affect morale with any change is to involve the officers in the change. Just like we need to reach out to the community, if there's going to be anything done in the community, we need to reach within our own department as well. It's much easier to push a program forward if a leader takes the time to get buy-in before actually flipping the switch to make the program happen. We have officers who do their duty respectfully, honorably, every day. If we're gonna change the way they do their job, I think it is incumbent upon, upon us as leaders to do what we have to do to let them know about the change and whenever and wherever possible, let them have a say. We may not agree, but at least they're heard. And you said there was a second part to that question? Yes, sir, second part. Um, yes, the second part, we had uh, allotted two minutes for the first question, but if oh. you want to go into the sec we second one, we might as well. Ready? Yes, Chief? Okay, the second part, police departments and law enforcement agencies in Tarrant County, as well as across Texas, are finding it very difficult to attract qualified applicants for police officer positions. Talk about your philosophy and your techniques relating to recruitment and retention of law enforcement personnel that reflect the community. One thing we know in Fort Worth right now is uh, the makeup of our department does not reflect the makeup of the community. When you have 64% of the officers that are Caucasian versus 39% of the city's population, it doesn't match up. When you have 35% of the population that's Hispanic, but only about 21 within the department, that doesn't match up. If you got about 19% of your population that's African-American, but only about 10% represent the officers in your department, 
that doesn't match up. Something that I hear people in law enforcement say frequently is, well, we tried, but the people we're trying to reach, the diversity we're wanting, they don't want the job. That's an excuse. If there's a problem with that, we need to do everything we can to possibly fix it. And the way I believe we fix that is the same way we deal with quality of life issues, the same way we deal with crime issues in communities. We go to the community. We can't expect to just show up at an HBCU or show up in a Hispanic community that may not have a lot of trust in the police department, sit down at a nice table with a banner, hand out literature, and expect people to flock to us. That's not going to happen. We have to be realistic about it. What I propose is we actually make the community a part of the process. If you look at the most successful companies in private industry that do the best at recruiting diversity, they find out what that target audience wants. They find out how to attract that target audience. They find out what it takes because they find out from their own perspective what we need to be doing to attract them. So I think we bring in community members, we bring in a panel who tells us, someone who has a voice for the community, says this is what you're doing wrong, this is what you could do right. And then we build a strong enough relationship with that panel that those trusted community members go with us in the community. So when we sit down with that pretty table and banner and hand out those nice pamphlets, it's not just an officer sitting there. There's a trusted member of the community sitting right beside us. And I will guarantee you the people that walk up and look at the tables and they see a lot of police officers and then our table with the community representing them at the table beside us, that's when people flock to our table. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Chief Noakes. Um, I'm going to just ask a procedural question here. When we had timed out for this, this was uh, we had um, indicated you would get each two minutes for each part of this question. Chief Noakes was comfortable in handling them both. Or is everybody else handling both? If you feel like you need a little extra time too, um, our timekeeper will be okay with that. All right. So this is the topic of officer recruitment, officer morale, and support. How do you implement change without negatively impacting officer morale? And also, what is your philosophy and techniques relating to recruitment and retention of law enforcement personnel that reflect the community? And now to you, Chief Swearingen. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll start with uh, the recruitment piece. You know, as uh, Chief Noakes uh, pointed out, that our police department doesn't mirror the city, and we're aware of that. So, I actually um, started a campaign to try to target women and minorities in our community, and I started it in 2019. Um, and I started it by myself. I'm not one that says me, 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 but actually I did this by myself. And so I had them give me the numbers. We had a civil service exam and the numbers were nowhere near where we needed them to be. So I asked HR, I said, can you pull those numbers? Can you give me the, not only the numbers, the names, the phone numbers, the emails of the applicants that are interested in taking the test because I'm gonna call them or email them and encourage them to show up. And so for five days, I made phone calls and I got with our media pro team and I said, look, I need you to create some memes or some videos to push out. And it was called Be the Change in Your Community because it was around that time that people were um, talking about they wanted to see change in the police department. So I came up with Be the Change in Your Community. And it was an aggressive uh, recruiting campaign for specifically for women and minority applicants. So. Um, Getting them to actually sign up and take the test is one part, but getting them to show up and actually take the test is the other. So there, I made phone calls, I sent emails, and we continued with this campaign. So we're doing it right now again. Um, this time, I have help doing it. It's not just me doing it. And we've created, I don't know if you follow us on social media, but look at all the videos and all the memes and all the things we're trying. We also spent money on advertising, uh, radio stations, uh, college newspapers, anything we could do to get the message out. I even used, uh, utilized our MAC program, our Citizens on Patrol. I mean, we sent the word out as much as we could. The NAACP, I sent them a flyer, again, trying to get help to recruit um, minority applicants. Um, th today, today I checked, we have over 1,400 applicants and they exactly mirror what our city is right now. So the next piece of that is, again, getting on that phone and sending emails and making a personal connection, a personal call. Um, and I've had the POAs on board, they're gonna help me do this. And, and, and recruiting is a passion of mine and I will continue until this city mirrors, until our department mirrors our city. Uh, for the morale and support, um, I think kind of what Chief Noakes uh, had already mentioned, we have to 
support our officers. As transparent as we're being with the community, we need to make sure we're doing that internally as well with our officers. Um, we want them to know that we appreciate the job that they're doing. You know, um, one of the things is recognizing them. We do um, audits um, to ensure they're in compliance with body-worn camera or uh, use of force or when we're reviewing reports. And when we notice good behavior, we need to showcase that and, and let their chain of command know they're doing a good thing. So I think we're rewarding the, the behavior. Let's see, um, implementing change. We need to implement change, yes, in, involving the officers. If it's something that's going to affect their bureau or their unit, we definitely need to try to include them in it. And, and when it's not feasible, tell them why not, why, we're, we're, why not we weren't discussing the policy change with them. You know, um, they're the ones who do that job. They know what they need to do that job to be successful. So I think including them is how we get change and how um, without reducing morale or um, any others. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chief Swearingen. For you, Chief Bainbridge. Uh, regarding the morale, um, it, it's already been stated. Too often, um, we as command staff, we don't explain the reasons why we're doing things. Just as we need to be transparent, it's been stated, uh, with the community, we have to with our officers. Too often, we'll fill in the blanks with what we don't know is something negative. And, uh, and we, as, an, as police officers, the worst at that. And so you have to go out there and talk to them. Don't be a stranger to those roll calls. Talk to them about the reason for the policy. Bring them into committees. You can bring them in, like for instance, your early warning system could be a committee base when you have an officer that's troubled and you're trying to get them in line with policy. Uh, in practice, you can have a committee that this, this case would go to that's con that uh, has a representative from every rank involved, including the union. Bring them in, because unless they're involved with that, then they'll see that it's fair. Like our citizens need to know that, uh, that we're fair and that our officers are fair. They need to see that command staff is fair. Morale and productivity are rarely inversed. They will, they will adjust very quickly. We have got to make sure that they understand why we're doing that, and then they'll understand. That we, we're very reasonable. We just have to know the reasons behind things. And that is really, you have to avail yourself. It has to be tireless, but that's how you bring a department up together uh, and uh, just to involve them all, including, including the union. Um, uh, regarding the recruiting, I think Fort Worth is to be commended, Julie, on the um, Be the Change campaign. It has increased uh, your minority and women applicants, and, and I think it's wonderful. You can also use mentorships um, with officers that are currently here, because a lot of people don't realize and don't know, myself included. When someone says, well, you need to be a police officer, I thought, really, me? And so I started looking into it, and it's like a wonderful career. And it has been the most intrinsically rewarding career I could possibly have. Uh, and I think that that when you talk and have when you have an officer talking to someone else and, and encouraging them that, uh, that they can apply that absolutely does help we've had that and it works and they even follow that through their cadet in their first year of training that they have that same mentor you can talk to you could look at schools and, and talk to them explore programs are great at that because these these our little ones are are basically raised in knowing our policies and knowing how we do things and uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, explorers that are now cadets. Uh, you can uh, go to universities, target radio stations, and start talking to the public where you want to recruit, and that's with your minorities again and, and your females. Let them know that they can, let them know that they're invited, and avail yourself that really works. But Be the Change is also a great program. Okay, thank you, mm -hmm. Chief Bainbridge. For you, Chief Gay. Thank you, Deborah. I'm, I'm going to sort of combine the, the change with the retention or the morale, because I, I believe they sort of go together somewhat. One is that I will tell you that police officers don't like change, and they don't like the way things are. So change is going to happen. A progressive agency is there will always be change. But as we've talked about with the community is you have to have trust and you have to have collaboration. You have to do the same thing inter inside your own organization. You have to have your officers believe that they are going to be part of the solutions that you're going to come up with. Uh, Wendy sort of talked about uh, having them part of your policies. I can tell you uh, about two years ago, we have a policy committee that actually looks at all our policies. And every now and then it comes back that an officer says, hey, did you think about this? And then we've got to, to redo it. 
And so we just said, you know what, we need to ensure that there are uh, people from all ranks that are vetting our policies. And so we've, we, we've changed that. We've made them part of the process. That's an example. And the retention aspect is that if you have good morale, if you have good collaboration and your officers trust that you really care for them, and it's all about officer wellness, is that your organization, uh, your men and women need to know that you care, that you're looking out for their, their mental, their, their spiritual, and their physical well-being. And if they believe that, then their morale is going to be high, and they're going to show up every day for you and they're going to give their best to you with their, with their servants' hearts that they came onto this department about. And I will transition to the, the, the applicant part. That is, that is a, a piece that we've all given great uh, ideas, marketing plans. We actually realized a few years ago that, that cops aren't the best at coming up with marketing plans. So we actually hired an expert that we brought on to sort of help us with and I, I think Neil talked about targeting audiences. There's, there's, pe there's ways to do that, that you can target the right people to, to attract the people into your organization. You also have to put real and bold letters is that what you tolerate as, uh, and what you don't tolerate as a department. So those coming in is like, I want to be part of that department. They're a department that doesn't tolerate discrimination or harassment or, or whatever it may be but they know what, what kind of culture that you have in your organization, is that if we're building trust and legitimacy in our communities, then our communities are gonna to wanna to be part of the department that is, is part of their community. I will give you an example is that we met with the, uh, our, our Black Officers Association and sort of talked about this specific issue. And I can tell you right now is that they said, you do know that we have uh, African Americans that are putting in for the department, but they're not making it through. And so the question is, why not? And then we started looking at that further and looking at the root causes, and there were barriers that, not by the TCO, not by the state agencies, but our own barriers that we had as an agency of disqualifiers that was disqualifying a large portion of African Americans. And it's not lowering standards, it's just standards that have been set for centuries of, and, and one example is, uh, is traffic tickets. You get a couple tra traffic tickets, you're, you're disqualified. Well, we know if you look at the data that African Americans are disproportionately stopped. So they may have a larger number of traffic stops or, or police interactions. So you really have to look deeper at the root causes of why people are not making it through to become the police officers. It's not just about the recruitment, it's about our processes that we have in place that is creating barriers for them to actually get on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Gay. For you, Sheriff Jones. Thank you very much. So the first part of the question, how do I implement change without negatively impacting uh, officer morale? And it's been said uh, accurately that you get feedback, but I think more importantly, when a leader realizes what change needs to be made, he sets that vision. And from that vision, he gets input and feedback uh, from those around him as to how we accomplish that vision. What it, where are we trying to get to and have them uh, participate or even completely come up with the answer of how we get there. So um, as my colleagues have said, feedback uh, from those who are going to be impacted by that change as a leader set that vision and then allow them to determine uh, the path to accomplishing that vision and change. So with respect to uh, recruiting and retention and having our police department uh, reflect what our community looks like. As the uh, commander of HR uh, back in uh, 2016, 2017 with Las Vegas Metro, we were going through the same thing. We uh, had lower numbers uh, of diversity and it did not reflect uh, the community of Las Vegas that we served. And so, uh, as Troy had mentioned earlier, we knew that, that we weren't the ones to come up with these campaigns. So uh, there's a very uh, uh, well-known uh, marketing firm in Las Vegas called r, &R Firm, uh, and they're the ones that came up with the what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So we went to them uh, as a, a private sector partner 
We knew we couldn't afford them. Uh, the, the city didn't have the money for it. Uh, and they offered to do the work for us pro bono. Uh, now, I don't know any marketing firms in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but I'm sure there are some who would be willing to do that, willing to advance the brand of the Fort Worth Police Department from that prof professional perspective uh, and, and rebrand it to where uh, we get a whole other generation, a whole other uh, segment of the population that wants to come to work as police officers and serve this community for Fort Worth Police Department. Uh, another thing that we did and what I think is very important is we looked at when we were giving the test uh, and we realized that we were giving all of our tests uh, and all of our um, elements of, of, of the process uh, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Well, what are most of the people doing when uh, that we're trying to recruit during that time frame? They're working. They have to provide for their families. And so we changed course and we realized that we can't make it convenient for us as a police department. We have to make it convenient for the applicant. Many of the people that we were trying to recruit are in jobs that, uh, where the benefits are not there. They don't have time off. They can't take time off. They're caring for their families. They can't miss work because they need that money to feed their families. But we knew that those people had life experience uh, that they could bring to the department and serve the community. So we revamped when we tested and where we tested. We brought our testing process to their community uh, during the weekends, on Saturdays, on Sundays, adjusted to where we could recruit the people uh, that we were, were trying to, to get on the department. And then lastly, I would say uh, the most important thing is, is as we start to build legitimacy within our communities and we start to build trust within our communities, we rely upon family members. We rely upon uh, community leaders. We rely upon uh, community groups to push those applicants towards us, to have them tell the young men and women in this city and around this city, you would make a fine police officer because you can instantly have legitimacy within this community. So we use them, force multiplier, uh, as our recruiters. And another thing that's very important, a lot of professional teams around the Dallas-Fort Worth area, a lot of people who can walk into these communities that we're trying to recruit diversity from, who have built-in legitimacy, um, athletes, um, entertainers. We get them on board. Uh, there's many of them that are speaking out right now about policing, uh, how we're doing it wrong, uh, the changes we need to make in policing. We use them to help us get the right people and get the right young uh, men and women into our police department. Thank you, Sheriff Jones. And for you, Chief Miller. With respect to uh, change, you know, Simon Sinek wrote a book and it's titled Starting with Why. And that's how um, you, can, you can make change in an organization is understand what your values are and the importance of the change that needs to occur. And then start with talking to the troops about why the change is needed. Then you can solicit the opinions from your rank and file. Like many people have said, they're the ones doing the job. So you express to them what the change needs to be and you solicit their opinions about how the change needs to occur and bring them along in the change. You can have an impact on morale. Now we all know, those of us who carry the badge know that you can give a cop a $100 bill and he's gonna complain that it's wrinkled because cops don't like change. But the fact of the matter is you can bring them along in a collaborative way in order to make change. Recruiting. I'm very proud to say in the Carrollton Police Department that our African-American population is 8% and our African-American officers is 8%. We spend a lot of time in focused recruiting. We do go to historically black universities. We do try to grow our own through programs like Fort Worth has a cadet program where we're in this and we're trying to use our Explorer program and trying to show young people that law enforcement is a noble profession that should be undertaken by many, many people. But in order to do that, we have to show them that our, our hearts. In the past, a recruiting video, everybody's talking about marketing. In the past, a recruiting video was a bunch of SWAT guys jumping off a truck, shooting guns, repelling off buildings. In today's world, kids don't want to see that. Kids want to serve the community. So we've had to pivot. We've changed. If you go to our website and look at our recruiting video, you'll see the heart of our department. And what we find is people want to come to work for us. When we ask people at our test, why did you test here? Because by the way, 
we're in competition with every other law enforcement agency in the Dallas Fort Worth area trying to recruit good, viable candidates. When we ask them, why did you come test here, they tell us because of the reputation of the police department. It's the work, like we were talking about earlier, we're going to beat you up with the word trust, but trust is the key. When we have trust in the community, we have shared values that are understood and exhibited by our cops, we have a reputation that precedes us, and people want to become part of that. Um, we can employ things like point-by-click uh, Google search. When you search, we pay. So if you search wins the test, it's, it's I shouldn't be giving this out. It's a trade, trade secret. It's, it's okay. <laughs> it, you know, it sends you to our site because we're trying to target a certain type of person to be a police officer in our city. All those strategies are effective. All those strategies, if employed properly, you can make gains in this space. I learned today that, I don't know if it's true or not, that the, the four police department only has one recruiter. I think we can add, I think you can add to that and do a, recruiting in an intentional manner and really, really have an impact because I firmly believe that our police departments ought to look like the communities that we serve. The other thing we have to realize is you can't just put a one-size-fits-all in the community. For example, in the city of Carrollton, we have a large Korean population, about 14% of our population is Asian. And recruiting in this community is much, much different than recruiting African Americans. In the Korean community, we have to recruit the parents. We have to show the parents that law enforcement is a noble profession. So knowing, understanding the terrain that you're on, having a, a vision that's crystalline that you understand will help you recruit and will help you make gains in those areas and will may help you make your police department look like your community. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Chief Miller. Um, for so those of you in the room and those of you watching us virtually, um, we're going a little bit longer than what we'd intended. The conversation is very important. As Jay Shop indicated, the hiring of a police chief is one of the most important decisions. I want to let you know we have one more question that we're going to take, take our candidates through again from the audience and then we'll wrap up. All right, so this time we'll start with Chief Swearingen. This question has to do with police monitor civilian oversight, which many of you have already mentioned. As you know, the city of Fort Worth in the past year implemented a civilian office of police monitor. What are your thoughts on working with a civilian police monitor or an oversight board? Okay, thank you. Um, the work we've done with the police monitor has been phenomenal. Um, she's been great to work with. We, we review policies. Um, we discuss uh, internal affairs cases, discipline, and um, I support it. I support what, uh, what Kim Neal is bringing to the table. Um, she has uh, provided us excellent input, and, and coincidentally, the same input that is being provided by the panel of experts. And so when she points something out, we were able to review our policies and, and we recognize our own deficiencies and we make the changes uh, ourselves. Um, I uh, think the program that she's putting together now or, or the committee that she's putting together now about the policy, civilian policy review committee is an excellent start. It's letting the citizens get a, an understanding and actually be able to review our policies and procedures. And, and I think that's a good way to start. Um, so I support what she's doing. And I also know as for a civilian, oversight. If that's the direction that the city and the department is going to head, I think uh, Kim Neal will make sure that that program is tailored to fit Fort Worth. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief Swearingen. Now we work our way around the table to you, Chief Bainbridge. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think that um, you know, iron sharpens iron. I really think that having um, outside perspective um, a lot of the community voice coming with it. Uh, you're, you have a very, Kim Neal is um, respected, she's reasonable, and she works with you. Um, I, I believe that, I, I know I wouldn't have a problem with that at all. Again, I, I like perspective, I like audits. I, I, I think that um, when we're building policy, for example, it's always good, like we said earlier, even to get the officer's perspective. It's also important to get outside perspective and having someone come through that lens and help us shape and guide that. I, I think it's wonderful. I, I don't have a problem with that at all. I think it makes us a, a better city, a better city department and um, we serve our communities better for it. Regarding oversight boards, same thing. Uh, I work in a city, we have an oversight of our IED cases. 
and it's fine. They look at, uh, we have a civilian board that looks at all of our shootings, anything regarding use of force, as well as um, uh, any incidents that result in a serious bodily injury or anything that the chief wants them to look at. And, and it runs smoothly. Again, you get the outside perspective of, of what's going on. It certainly helps you stay closer to the community. Those are community volunteers that are on that board, and so they're from the community. And again, it's transparency. It's opening up all of these cases so they'll know that we take this seriously. So I think it's very important on both fronts, and I, and I think it's great. All right. Thank you, Chief Bainbridge. Chief Kay? Thank you. Uh, I believe it's absolutely necessary I have been part of oversight uh, since 2001, so probably uh, around 20 years of my career I have uh, been a part of oversight. So I, I just think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's natural to me for them to be oversight. It provides the necessary accountability and transparency. Uh, but I also think that we built relationships with our, with our police monitor. The, the, the monitor will, will bring a different lens uh, into to our world to allow us to see things a little bit differently. Uh, she has uh, helped us with, uh, the current monitor has helped us look at policies and really shed light into areas that, that, uh, that, that we weren't aware of. Sometimes we get in this police lens and, and, and we don't recognize all the, the traps or the areas that we need to, to really change. Uh, uh, we have had oversight. Uh, actually, we had Citizens Review Board and, uh, for many years, and, and then we went without a contract, and then uh, I actually sat on a committee to really look at the new uh, police oversight and how that was going to take place in 2018 in its current form, and we just instituted a new Citizens Review Board, which is really looking at critical incidents like, like Wendy talked about, as well as looking at our policies. So I absolutely support it. I think it's uh, needed, but also think it helps to build community trust. And and I know we keep saying the the part with trust, but they know our department. And I can tell you, she's the biggest uh, one of our biggest advocates to really when community members come and talk about, hey, this this happened. Why why did this happen? I want to complain, and they can educate the community and say, well well here is the policies and procedures and here is what they follow. So they can also be a, an, an added, a force multiplier to our agency to really uh, be an advocate for our, our, our police department. Thank you. All right, Sheriff Jones. Thank you. So one of the six pillars of President Obama's 21st century policing task force is policy and oversight. So if we're going to say in policing that we are following the models uh, that are put forth uh, we have to have oversight within our department. Um, like Troy's department in Austin, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department has had a Citizens Review Board oversight for 20 years. We instituted it in 2000, uh, and it got fully uh, up and running in, in 2001. And one thing that's important to point out about our Citizens Review Board is that they have subpoena powers. So they can subpoena officers to come in uh, and make statements uh, in the inquiries that they are conducting. Uh, it's very important that that, that takes place, otherwise uh, it, it's pretty much fruitless. Um, it's not foreign to me. Uh, in fact, it would be foreign to me to not have oversight. And so I fully support uh, outside oversight. I, I fully support um, a citizens uh, a review board. Um, that is something that, that I believe has to happen uh, in this age uh, in policing and to help, uh, to help increase legitimacy with our public. Uh, as I stated before, I chair a board that also uh, has four citizens who sit on that board and have full voting rights uh, with respect to use of force and tactical reviews uh, of a critical incidents. So um, I obviously support it. I work in it every single day. Uh, I work with our citizens review board uh, and I obviously work on, on the use of force board um, where citizens have complete and total say and representation uh, in how our police department operates. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you, Sheriff Jones. Chief Miller? I'll, I'll simply say that I'm a, a proponent of, of uh, the, the monitor and auditor. I think that uh, I mentioned it earlier, 
we need to, in order to build and maintain trust, we need to make sure that our words are consistent with our deeds. And if we're telling the public that we're holding people accountable, it only makes sense that we have an external review of our policies and processes. Um, like I mentioned before, we have in my department a compliance manager. Now, this person reports to the office of the chief of police, but it, you know, it, it'd be, it would have even more force and show the public more commitment if the person was uh, reporting to someone outside of the police department. Uh, recently, I asked the compliance manager, I noticed that there was a pattern and practice uh, case in Lubbock with respect to how they hire, and I had our compliance manager look into our hiring processes make sure that how we're hiring is, is the correct way and we're up doing things the proper way. And we found that there were some issues that we needed to fix. We needed to work with our, our human resources in order to make sure that uh, we fix these problems and we've, we're, we're doing that. So we would not have had that if we didn't have the ability for someone to focus in on our police department to show us, to make sure that our words are consistent with our deeds. So uh, this is uh, any progressive police department in America um, it should be open to these ideals and should be open to this level of collaboration with the community. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Miller. For you, Chief Noakes. Transparency and accountability. Those are two of the words we have heard from the community over and over again. And we have heard what the community said. Uh, police monitor and civilian oversight is set up for just a purpose. We have had a good working relationship with the police monitor, Kim Neal. She has assisted us with uh, some policy changes, recommendations on things that needed to be done that actually did align perfectly with what we saw from the panel of experts. Uh, she has done a great job assisting us with community engagement, even in the time of COVID, when we can't necessarily meet like this. And even when we do, it's like this. We've been able to meet digitally, even in breakout sessions, because of forums that Ms. Neal set up across the community. And one thing a lot of people probably do not realize, we actually have a representative from the Office of the Police Oversight Monitor who sits in our Use of Force Review Board. It's not just police officers looking at what we're doing. We actually have someone from Kim Neal's office that is in there to add an extra layer, a layer of accountability and an extra layer of transparency. I don't think it's really a question of whether we get civilian oversight in Fort Worth. I believe it's a question of whether or not the Fort Worth Police Department is a part of the process. We can try to stand our ground and be stubborn and push back, or we can be part of it. I choose to be part of it. If there is a system that's going to be put in place, I think it behooves us to be at the table when it's designed. We have review models, investigative models, uh, auditor, monitor models. There are a lot of hybrid models that are actually in place in different agencies across the uh, country. And it seems to me in Fort Worth, we don't need to take necessarily a model that's just a cookie cutter replica of what we see somewhere else. Personally, I trust Kim Neal to get out into the community to find what the city of Fort Worth needs and design a model that will work for all of us. All right, thank you so much, Chief Noakes. And that takes us through the big topics that were submitted under the community questions. Thank you so much. You all have had an extremely long day. I know we appreciate your time and your energy and your mental power to answer these very important questions that our community wants to know. We have one more for you. It is your closing statement. I want to know when you do have time for a hobby, what is it? Just kidding. You can answer that if you want. But actually, your closing statement is, what makes you the best choice for this position? You've given many answers, but you know, everybody says, what's your elevator speech? Why are you the one we need to hire? And that's what we want to hear. Our timer will put you at one minute for this. And if you do want to answer the hobby question, that's okay. And Chief Swearingen, you're closest to that microphone at the end, so that's where we'll start. Okay, um, I think what makes me best for this position, um, I have a servant heart, I'm genuine, you know, and I try to see the good in, in all people. You know, I believe in second chance and helping those in need. Um, I think what our department or city needs right now is rebuilding the trust with the community. And I think I'm the person that can bridge that gap along with other officers in our department. You know, I think a lot of times the community sees us as uh, 
enforcers. They don't see us as true members of the community or just as average people. Um, I think I can bridge the gap with officers because we come from similar backgrounds or the very background and the very community that we're trying to rebuild that trust with. You know, I think um, we can use this personal connection and I'll use my own personal. I mentioned um, before I come from a home, from a, a single parent home, young mother with two kids, um, followed in her footsteps, got pregnant at a young age, dropped out of school and had to rely on government aid um, because of the decisions I made as a young adult. And I think a lot of times when the community members say we, don't, we haven't walked in their shoes or we don't know the struggle, I can honestly say I have and I do. And I think I'd like to use that as a personal connection to build the trust with the community and uh, gain that trust. I think, again, you need to look at what does the department need right now in the city? And I think it's having the people skills to be able to connect with the community members that we serve. Thank and my you hobby, oh, yes. eating. <laughs> <laughs> Which you probably will do right after this is over. All right, Chief Noakes. I think it's important to have somebody at the top of the organization, when I say top, not because they're the best position, because it's the best person, because they need to take a leadership role. We need to take someone who recognizes the situation we are in right now for what it is. We can look at it, at it as a negative time in our country, in our city, in our department, or we can look at it as an opportunity for some of the most amazing change we've seen in this city and in law enforcement and policing in general. We have an opportunity to take a city that I believe is better positioned than any other similarly sized city to be a model for other agencies across the country and how we engage with the community, how we support our officers, how the health, wellness, and resiliency of not only our own agency but the people we serve is a top priority for us. We have to be the agency that goes out there and makes a difference, not just through traditional policing methods, but by showcasing the amazing work our officers do every single day to serve the citizens of Fort Worth. And if given the opportunity, I would love to have a chance to lead my Fort Worth family in that effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Noakes. Chief Miller. I've had experience of changing the culture of a police department, having the, having the experience of instilling a community engagement philosophy into a police department, effective, crime suppression tactics deployed, effective hiring practices, and collaborating on the regional and state level with partners here in the area. I've sat in the number one chair. I understand um, what it's like to be the executive, the top executive of a large organization, and I understand what it takes to run this police department. I'll tell you, I'll leave you with this because my time is running short. There's one thing that you will find in every family, every organization, every school, every church, that if you remove it, it will fail, and that is trust. Con conversely, if we can leverage trust, prosperity and growth will occur, and that's what needs to happen. I've done it, I've sat in that chair, I'm from this town, this is my hometown, and my heart is here in Fort Worth, and I would love to be the chief of police here. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Miller. Sheriff Jones. Well, thank you. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that each one of my uh, fellow candidates knows the issues at hand. Uh, they've represented that up here and, and said it very well. They each know what needs to be done in our cities across the nation. Uh, they each know uh, what we have to do as a police department. What sets me apart is I have led through that change. Uh, I have a proven track record of police reform. I've been proven track record of being able to execute. Uh, police reform is not easy, but I've been through it. We went through it uh, several years ago, and it's not a one and done. Once you start reform, you have to continually change to meet the demands and, and what the public expects of the police department. Thank so with that, I'll say this, that it, Fort Worth needs a leader in its police department who has that experience, who's led through that collaborative change, who's listened to the communities, and who has a track record of putting uh, recommendations in place uh, to, to better our communities uh, and to push this police department forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Jones. Chief Kay. Thank you so much for uh, spending time tonight. I wanted to thank you for being part of this process. 
I am and have always been a change agent, a reformer, somebody who brings my experience to you, which I think will be an asset to the Fort Worth team. I have the ability to bring people together, has been talked about already about uh, just collaboration and trust, which is needed, which is the key. I have a work ethic that I will work hard for you. I will work hard for the department. And I will work hard for the, the Fort Worth team together. Because once again, we cannot do this alone. It takes a team. It does take a leader, and I want to be that leader, but I recognize that there are many people that need to be side by side, working together and collaboratively. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Kane. Chief Bainbridge? Yes, ma'am. Well, I first want to say that um, it is a privilege to be up here with these finalists. I, I think a lot of each and every one of them, and, and I think the city has a very difficult job. Um, I believe that uh, Chief Cross is leaving behind a very good department, so thank you for your service. Um, I want to say that I feel in my 29 years career, I've been involved with a lot of the programs, either creating them or being involved with them, that you want to bring to Fort Worth. I've been involved with several mental health programs to uh, divert some of these calls, many of these calls, and, and these folks that need other types of services other than law enforcement away into the mental health authority. Uh, that changes lives. I've been involved with the Citizens Review Board uh, with our, our department, as well as working with the citizenry uh, to prevent crime and to address problematic uh, issues in their communities that aren't necessarily crime related, but maybe more of a nuisance type related. I've been working with that in that capacity for several years. I believe in uh, data-driven intelligence to look at uh, crime both violent and nonviolent crime. And I believe in these programs, and I'm constantly looking at the success of these programs to make sure that they are indeed working. Again, many times we can say, well, we put in a, government's really bad about this. Well, we'll start programs, and then they won't, they won't track them uh, to ensure its success. And I believe that's what we owe our citizens. Um, and so again, I'd like to close by saying it's, uh, it's a profound privilege to be in law enforcement. It uh, truly is a privilege serving our citizens and working with our officers. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Chief Bainbridge. Uh, that brings us to the conclusion of tonight's community forum. You have gotten a chance to uh, get to know a little bit about the six finalists for the job of Police Chief of Fort Worth. Thank you so much for being in this room tonight. Thank you for joining us through the virtual channels. The interview process will continue and ultimately decision will be made by the city manager, David Cook. Uh, you heard Jay Choppa say that if you have feedback, something that you want to share, continue to use the website that you use to submit the questions. I know the city manager's team would love to hear your input. Once again, can we please a round of applause for our finalists, Chief Wendy Bainbridge, Chief Troy Gray, Assistant Sheriff Chris Jones, Chief Derek Miller, Chief Neil Noakes, and Chief Julie Swearingen. Thank you so much. I think your day is officially done for you to get up and do it all again tomorrow in a different form. Good night, everyone. Have a safe evening.